I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day. Welcome to Around San Diego. I'll get you caught up on a week's worth of news and look ahead in just 30 minutes. We do start with our stormy weather. This week's winter storm caused flooding, down trees, and power outages. We learned the rainfall has also forced the city to release water from Lake Hodges. The city's public utilities is working to get the lake down to about 278 feet. These re, um, excuse me, these releases could last up to 10 days, depending on how much more rain we get at higher elevations. The storm has created a winter wonderland with local agencies urging caution, though. To wait until the storm has actually passed, it buys our crews sometimes, the county crews sometimes, to get in there and plow those roads and make it safer for individuals and then go up and enjoy with your families. Yeah, they of course recommend taking it slowly on the roads and leave your home well prepared for the elements if you are headed to the mountains. And a home for wounded warriors was another victim of the storm, but just got a much needed and expensive makeover. The Vista home houses male military veterans who are transitioning into civilian life. CBS 8's Abby Black reports on how the community created a new path for military heroes. For five months, Wounded Warrior Homes had to close its doors for water damage repairs. That was five months that they couldn't fill five beds for wounded veterans. Now there's a new beginning inside the home where the men live. From moldy walls in November. A water leak in a bathroom that took out a wall and a cabinet and we had mold. To this newly renovated five bedroom home in Vista. I just want to thank the community because without the community support, we wouldn't have been able to get this house back to where it is and back online. Wounded Warrior Home co-founder Mia Roseberry says that there were $35,000 in repairs. Water leaks in the bathroom, shower and kitchen were fixed. There's also a fresh coat of green paint on the home, new bedroom furnishings and a new heating and AC unit. The nonprofit provides transitional housing and support services to military veterans. It was devastating because that's five beds we can't offer. That's five veterans or more that we can't support that are out there on the street that are contemplating suicide. One of those veterans is U.S. Marine Sergeant Luis Garcia. They found me literally off the streets out here in San Diego. Uh, I was recently going through a divorce at that time. That I was one of the ones that did not want to ask for help. That was in 2019. It has been a stepping stone in a big way in a lot of times. So thank you. Six years earlier, the combat veteran received the Navy and Marine Corps Medal. It's one of the highest Marine awards for heroism. Give you a hug on this one. <laughs> Gracias. Every transition right here. It's been years. And thank you. So excited Never. for how you've done yeah. and how far you've come and how far you're going to go. So, thank you. Garcia recently graduated from mechanics school in Riverside and just moved into the renovated home. And thanks again for having me in here. This home not only lays the foundation for their future, but gives veterans a sense of purpose. The purpose of a home is to give us a safe place to land and to be able to think of what our next step is. Some injuries may not be as visible as others, but Garcia says Wounded Warrior Home saved his life. From as little as the socializing to being able to go out and talk to a community again, from financial classes even to education, I'm finally I'm a graduate now. So that's a good feeling. It's a good thing to say. In Vista, I'm Abby Black, CBS 8. Abby, thanks. And meantime, bacteria and chemicals found in contaminated water from the Tijuana River are not just ending up in our ocean, but also in the air we breathe. That's according to a new study from UC San Diego. CBS 8's Rocia de la Fe looks into what scientists found and the possible implications it can have on our health. The first of its kind study focuses on the ongoing issues of contaminated waters from the Tijuana River and takes it a step further to see its impact in the air. What researchers found only adds to the growing concerns for people living along our coastlines. Researchers at UC San Diego have identified a new source of major pollution, coastal waters. New research shows the sewage contaminated waters transferred to the atmosphere in what's known as sea spray aerosol, which is formed by breaking waves and bursting bubbles. The sea spray aerosol contains bacteria, viruses, and chemicals. Once pollutants become airborne, 
That just means that so many more people can be exposed to those pollutants. It just extends well beyond people just going to the beach or getting in the water. The team conducted the study by sampling coastal aerosols at Imperial Beach and water from the Tijuana River between January and May of 2019. Researchers used DNA sequencing and mass spectrometry to identify the microbes. I think it was just a complete shock to find how much of the microbes in the air were traceable directly back to sewage. The team is now hoping to find out whether the bacteria bacteria and chemicals can be infectious and what the implications to human health are when inhaled. We are going to start swabbing the lifeguards and the surfers, some of the surfers and families down there to sort of, you can see it in the air, but what is physically getting into people? Additionally, the team will look at not only the air outside, but inside. They plan on putting samplers and doors to test for bacteria and chemicals. That's the next big sort of step from a from a health perspective. Although more research is needed to find out how far pollutants travel, researchers say it's likely that air currents can carry sea spray for miles further inland. The further it goes, the more dilute it becomes. Because there's also, there's human health, there's also agriculture health. So these are things that we are going to be addressing with these further studies. The team says the current findings justify the need to prioritize cleaning up coastal waters and stopping the flow of sewage from the Tijuana River. We have an infrastructure problem um, that's causing not only um, polluted water, but here this research demonstrates that people in coastal communities like Imperial Beach are exposed to coastal water pollution even without entering that water. Garcia de la Fe, CBS 8. Interesting. Rocio, thanks. And after a whole lot of rain and a little bit of sunshine, the beauty is now in full bloom at the Carlsbad Flower Fields. Our Brian White spent the day soaking it all in. Yeah, with the beautiful sights, the wonderful smells, and the gorgeous weather, this is the place to be. Spring is in the air here at the world famous Carlsbad flower fields, which are now open and people are lining up. This is great. We come every year and the kids love it. They love the tractor ride and all the beautiful flowers on Matthew. It's stunning. We're just so grateful for the weather. Bursting with a rainbow of colors, the flower fields here are surely a sight to see. They're pink, red, orange on Matthew, yellow, white. Oh, it's beautiful. I'm in awe. <laughs> So much color. It's just like they're smiling at you. This place is known for its giant Tecalodi ranunculus flowers, and they're already blooming. We've got strong stems, big flowers, and lots of them. Fred Clark is general manager here at the fields, and he's on cloud nine working here. It elevates your mood. That's what happens when you come here. You can't help but feel some weight has been lifted off your shoulders or some burden, at least while you're here. Families can tour the fields in style on the tractor wagon ride. So fun. Yeah, it's wonderful. So good. <laughs> so what exactly is it about flowers that we just love so much? Flowers smell incredible, um, especially this time of year with all the rain that we've been having. It's just really nice to be outside in the sunshine and just among the colors and the scents. It's fantastic. It's no wonder a quarter million visitors come through here every season from March through early May. With sunshine and gorgeous weather, it's hard to beat. Feels good after the cold and the rain and the wind. It feels really good. Well, considering we're from snowy cold Bozeman, Montana, it's perfect. It's like flower bathing out here. You just can't help but feel so alive in all these flowers. In Carlsbad, Brian White, CBS 8. Ugh, just gorgeous, truly. Well, another top story this week, the COVID-19 emergency in San Diego County is officially over. It ended Tuesday along with California's state of emergency. It's been three years since that was declared. The first San Diego resident to be confirmed infected was on March 9th of 2020. The stay at home order was issued on March 19th, starting a roller coaster of shutdowns and COVID waves. You know this. We now have a vaccine and better treatments, but the county is still experiencing two to 300 new cases a day. We could hit 1 million confirmed cases by this summer. And while the end of our state of emergency serves as a signal for life post COVID, the question of where COVID-19 came from is once again hotly contested. A classified Department of Energy report is the latest pointing to a possible lab leak in China. There's hardly a consensus, but experts say that knowing how the pandemic started still matters. 
Sources close to the U.S. government's investigation of the origins of COVID-19 tell CBS News new information suggests a lab leak is a possibility. However, the Department of Energy has, quote, low confidence for that finding, possibly because of weak data or limited information. The intelligence community and the rest of the government is still looking at this. Um, it, it, there's not been a definitive conclusion. The White House did not publicly approve of the report. Several investigations have come to different conclusions over time. Some point to the possibility the virus naturally jumped from animals to humans. The World Health Organization has said they need deeper probes to come to definitive answers, and federal officials say China has made it hard to get them. For more than two years now, the PRC has been blocking from the beginning international investigators and members of the global health uh, community. With more than a million Americans and more than 7 million people dead around the world, experts say part of our defense for the next pandemic is figuring out how this one started. Knowing the origins of COVID really matters because it will impact how we prepare for the future. So if this was the result of a lab leak, it may result in tighter safety procedures in the lab, more regulations on what kind of research is allowed. That was our Jesse Pagan there reporting and the special congressional committee on China will be talking about this during a public hearing this month, saying it's a national security priority at this point. Well, there's a renewed push in the Capitol to send California families a child tax credit. If approved, it would send low income families roughly $1,000 per household every year. Our political reporter Morgan Reiner has details from Sacramento. Right now, California does provide low income California families that have children under the age of six with a child tax credit. But a seven member Miguel Santiago says that poverty doesn't simply stop when your child reaches the age of six. During the pandemic, the federal government offered tax relief to low income Americans with kids. It meant money right in their pockets. That ended in 2021. That was the largest anti-poverty program. The risk that we're facing here in the state of California is we could see 1.7 million children fall back into poverty. If the federal government won't continue the assistance, he said California must. One of the reasons we're fighting so hard for this program is because we saw what could happen when you give people uh, a little bit of help. These are people who are working full-time jobs, often, often can't make ends meet, and the ability to just make that rent, the ability to just put food, food on the table uh, becomes a game changer. The bill would give families, regardless of immigration status, that make less than 30000 a year, $1,083 if they have kids under the age of 18, if they have children aged 19 to 23 who are students, or if any child of any age has permanent and total disabilities. Because we know that if you have to care for somebody, uh, that care is going to be for life, and we want to make sure uh, that people aren't falling into poverty and, land, and landing homeless. The program comes at a cost and at a time when the state is facing a $22 billion deficit. We're looking at about close to $700 million um, per year, uh, but for a very important program. Uh, and look, if California can uh, afford and has in the past sending uh, middle class uh, refunds, uh, to those who are making half a million dollars a year, uh, we could afford uh, to make sure that those who are living on the verge of poverty at $30,000 and below uh, to be able to get this child tax credit. Santiago introduced a similar bill last session that would extend the child tax credit, but just one time. That bill did not make it through. It failed. Now, I reached out to several California organizations, the California Tax Association, the Howard Jarvis Tax Foundation, to see where they stand on a proposal like this one. I have not heard back from them, but I did reach out to the California Republican Caucus, and they told me that they would have to look further into this before they could publicly comment comment on it. Morgan, thanks. And San Diego Mayor Todd Gloria is joining mayors from across the state as they focus on mental health and homelessness. Gloria and other leaders are pushing for a bill that could detain people with addictions who refuse to get help and send them to treatment. What happens to those folks is all across this state, which are folks living unsheltered in extremely dangerous situations uh, where too often the end result is their death. 
Advocacy groups who focus on disability rights oppose the law. They say it could lead to locking more people up against their will and depriving them of fundamental rights, including privacy and liberty. Well, TikTok has announced a new way to prevent teens from endlessly scrolling on its app. The social media platform will soon have a one hour time limit for users under 18. Ready Children's Hospital is applauding their efforts, but based on the astronomical spike in mental health issues they are seeing in kids, it still may not go far enough. For example, the new feature addresses the amount of time on the app, but not the content kids are consuming. So again, TikTok will be setting a daily one hour time limit for those under 18. Once 60 minutes hits, teens will be prompted to enter a passcode to extend their time on the app. So concerned parents or guardians keep that code private and know that the new setting can be turned off. The doctor I spoke to says more screen time means a greater risk of depression and anxiety. Month after month, their local emergency room is breaking records when it comes to kids coming in with mental health issues. Rady sees a minimum of 20 kids a day in the ER. The majority are between the age of 14 and 16, but they've sadly seen some as young as eight having suicidal thoughts. Dr. Willow Jenkins is warning parents about screen time and hopes parents wait until their child is at least 12 to get on social media. Teens are actually averaging about five to eight hours a day on screens, which is a huge amount considering that the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines are recommending two. So the majority of our teens and children are far exceeding screen time limits. And the implication of this, it doesn't matter what they're doing on screens, it means that they're not engaging in other activities. Yeah, Radies has a dedicated psychiatric emergency room at the hospital, which is one of just few in the U.S. However, the wait list for outpatient services is around nine months. TikTok also announced an update to its family pairing feature. This means parents will be able to filter videos with words or hashtags they don't want to appear in their teen's feed. So the advice is to be aware and involved in their online activity and take the time to research those privacy settings. Well, we are now getting a closer look at how much the city of San Diego is paying in overtime to San Diego police and firefighters. We are about halfway through the fiscal year and both departments are projected to go way over budget. The police department is citing ongoing staffing shortages along with violent crime for the uptick in those hours. SDPD is estimated to go 9.2 million over the $40 million that's already budgeted for OT. The San Diego Fire Department is expected to pay $15.7 million in extra overtime. That is in addition to the $32 million that the city had budgeted for. Now we are getting a look at the profits SDG&E raked in while consumers were paying higher gas and electric bills. Last year, SDG&E earned $915 million in revenue, up $96 million from 2021. The utility's parent company, Sempra Energy, revealed that in a quarterly earnings call. San Diego Gas and Electric announced this week that it would give around $16 million to help programs for customers struggling to pay skyrocketing bills and nonprofits that provide essential services to vulnerable customers. Overall, Sempra made nearly $3 billion in 2022, up from the nearly $2.6 billion in 2021. <clears throat> Well, as San Diego County continues to face a surge in fentanyl overdoses, some parents are coming together to demand that this be tackled more as a public health crisis than strictly a criminal justice issue. A special town hall Monday night organized by the local nonprofit A New Path or Parents for Addiction Treatment and Healing called for more compassion and less criminalization when it comes to addressing fentanyl and other drugs. We would much rather see our resources go to harm reduction, to education, safety first drug education, than to see it go back to the criminal justice system where everybody loses. Yeah, they are also pushing for more widespread availability of naloxone, better known as Narcan, which can rapidly reverse an opioid overdose. For more information, just go to CBS8.com and click on the help button. 
Well, a former San Diego State football player facing a felony possession of child pornography charge pleaded not guilty at this, his arraignment on Thursday afternoon. 20-year-old Nolan Iwaliko is one of three now former players who were targets of an investigation involving an alleged gang rape of a minor at an off-campus party in 2021. During the course of that investigation, child pornography was allegedly discovered on Iwaliko's iCloud account. Well, former TV news anchor Sandra Moss took the stand Tuesday in the equal pay trial against KUSI. In the third week of testimony, Moss testified about her background and career, as well as her negotiation for more pay. Throughout her career, she's had jobs in radio, a TV station in Reading, and more than a decade here at CBS 8. She was offered a morning anchor job in 2004 with her starting salary at 100000 By 2010, she was making $120,000, and she said she hadn't had a raise in a while. She also said there was always an excuse for management on why she couldn't get a raise. Well, some parents in the San Diego Unified School District say its disciplinary policy isn't working. The superintendent now has plans to look into it. The district says its restorative discipline policy takes an anti-racist and restorative approach to negative behaviors. It relies on things like counseling or mediation before suspension or expulsion. Parents who attended a school board meeting say that it's too lenient and allows students to get away with bad behavior. This policy has not only failed my son, but it has also failed his offender by offering very little to no consequences for their actions. In fact, this policy has enabled and encouraged students' behavior to become violent and aggressive. The policy was first implemented in 2020. The school board says that they do plan to re-examine it. Well, Chat GPT is an artificial intelligence program that is taking the world by storm. It can write a term paper, solve a math problem, or create a legal document in just seconds. CBS 8's Anna Laurel found students are using it to turn in schoolwork. She shows us whether San Diego school leaders are concerned or excited about this AI in the classroom. You can ask ChatGPT any question on any topic and you'll get a detailed response in just seconds. Students are using it for schoolwork, adults are using it in the workplace, so is it a new way of learning or a new way of cheating? Write a 1,000 word essay about how San Diego has changed over the past 20 years. In less than five seconds, ChatGPT writes this report about San Diego write a 500 word essay in the voice of a 10 year old about how the solar system was created. A long, long time ago, about 4.6 billion years ago, there was a big cloud of gas and dust in space. There are positives to it, but just like using it constantly for all your assignments or like right, having it write things for you is not obviously not a positive no. thing. ChatGPT writes responses that sound human like. These three Torrey Pines High School students tell me their classmates use ChatGPT for everything from English essays to math and science answers. I just think it really leaves an unfair advantage for those who choose not to use it. And then they're kind of going head to head with someone who is having a computer do their work for them. ChatGPT is a free computer program anyone online can use. The Torrey Pines High Wi-Fi blocks it, which means San Diego joins the Los Angeles Unified School District and New York City Public Schools, banning its access. But kids can still access it through their personal hotspots or phones. Why not use it? I think for a lot of students, busy work doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and it's something that's really boring. Uh, so when you have something that can really speed up that process, obviously you better use it. So is it cheating? I asked ChatGPT that very question. It says yes. Using ChatGPT to do your work can be considered cheating. And it's like any new technology is how does this fit in the education space? Matthew Tessier is the Assistant Superintendent of Innovation for the San Diego County Office of Education. He says they're not telling districts to ban ChatGPT. Instead, they're training teachers how to use it. This is a YouTube video from their workshop. The important part is how do we help support our teaching staff to get up to speed on how ChatGPT can be an accelerant to student learning. A starter to, you know, generate new ideas. Maybe you're at a moment where you're like, I just want to get some ideas. And then you take that and you enhance it. Poway Unified's Dr. Jennifer Burke says their schools are not banning, but talking with students about how to use ChatGP to chase new ideas, to question what AI tells them, and to use it ethically. We want them to be critical thinkers. So how can we use 
the conversation around chat GPT in a way to bring out critical thinking. So, so how long would it take you to write this, you think, on your own? <laughs> Probably at least an hour to an hour and a half. And this took how long? 14 seconds. The San Diego teenagers I spoke with understand AI is here to stay. They just don't want it to take away from the unique human experience. That there's a real awesome element of that, that humans bring to their own writing and something that that's something that the, this chat GPT really can't replicate. In San Diego, this is Anna Laurel for CBS 8. Boy, that's the future. Definitely an interesting conversation, Anna, thanks. Well, as of March 1st, Chula Vista has the strongest renter protections in the entire county. These new protections are specifically aimed at renters who face eviction for so-called no-fault reasons, such as making renovations. Remodels will now have to be significant, costing at least $40 per square foot. For tenants who've lived in a place longer than a year, 60 days notice is required, and landlords will also have to to pay the tenant either two months contract rent or the market rate according to HUD, whichever is greater. For elderly and disabled tenants, that increases to three months. Which means these are tenants who are not doing anything wrong. They're current with the rent, they're not breaking any term of the lease, but the law still allows the landlord to evict you. Many property owners say that these new rules are too overreaching, threatening to push mom and pop landlords out of the market. For more information on these new renter protections, go to CBS8.com. Well, right now, the San Diego Police Department is putting forward a plan to regain access to 500 smart streetlight surveillance cameras and give them new license plate reading capabilities. Thousands of the streetlight cameras were installed and then in use until 2020. That's when city leaders agreed to cut off SDPD's access to the cameras in response to protests over privacy concerns. You can weigh in on the proposed plan at any of the 10 public hearings that are scheduled for next week. The first to our Monday at the Otay Mesa and Rancho Penasquitos libraries. Well, we have an update now on the nine-year-old German Shepherd, Indy, who fell down an abandoned well in Benita four weeks ago. Indy is still recovering in Sereno Valley after undergoing back surgery. Veterinarians found a ruptured disc that made it hard for him to walk. Before his back surgery, Indy had a battle to ha also had to battle a bacterial infection. Indy's owner says that it could be another couple of months before he's back to his normal self. Well, you heard this news, believe it or not, even after Manny Machado's 11-year, $350 million extension became official, the Padres are actually in a better position to go on after their to go after their next big fish. Whether that be Juan Soto or Otani, someone else even, Machado's new deal is actually saving the Friars a large sum of money, at least for the next three years. Under his old deal, Manny was making over $30 million per year. The next three seasons, his base salary salary will be at 13 million a season. Now, of course, that means that the contract is backloaded, but it opens up this championship window for San Diego even further. On Monday, Manny spoke with the media. You know, I've been in some different organizations in the, in the past, and um, you know, I've never been a part of the, a team like this that you know everyone cares for one another, everyone looks up to each other, and, and we, we push each other at the end of the day. And you know, whenever you have a group like that, uh, you know, you, you can never take that for granted. Yeah, glad he wants to stay. And speaking of the pods, Joe Musgrove fractured his left big toe after dropping a kettlebell on it in the weight room. Manager Bob Melvin says that will be a minimum of two weeks before Musgrove can even throw again, let alone get his arm built up in time for opening day. The injury puts Joe's status for the start of the regular season in question. American Heart Month just recently ended, but the focus on keeping our hearts healthy certainly shouldn't. San Diego's unique lifestyle radiates laid back vibes, but that doesn't make us immune to stress and anxiety, America's most common mental illnesses. CBS aides Jesse Pagan shows us how much of an impact mental health has on our physical well being. How stressed out are you? Oh, 11. I'd say it's 7 out of 10. I'm about to pay for college, so. <laughs> It's not a secret. Between the pandemic's lasting effects, the economy, politics, and whatever else weighs us down every day, we are stressed out. After stress gave me my own heart scare at the age of 30, I wanted to figure out how this 
can affect this. It's so important that whenever we're treating an individual, we're treating their whole life. At Rogers Behavioral Health in Rancho Bernardo, Dr. Maya Dion sees how stress and anxiety play out firsthand. Stress really is the physical and the mental reaction that we have to a stressor, which is essentially anything happening outside of us that causes us stress. It's our fight or flight reflex. In the animal kingdom, the threat is real. For example, prey trying to escape a predator. But for people, it doesn't have to be. Humans have this unique ability to imagine. So we can just imagine something happening. Either it hasn't happened yet, or we can think back into the past. And we can create and generate that same internal physical reaction. Unmasked. Imagined or not, we've recently gone through what Dr. Dion calls collective stress, like the pandemic's impacts. It's just adding on extra layers of stress globally, so we're seeing this increase. A late 2022 poll from the American Psychiatric Association found 37% of Americans rated their mental health fair or poor. That's up from 31% in 2021. Meantime, 26% of people expected to be more stressed out this year. I'm seeing a lot more stress in my office, in the clinic, and in the hospital. I have patients coming and telling me I am stressed out and my blood pressure numbers are off the chart. Dr. Lori Daniels is a professor and cardiologist at UCSD Health. Stress and anxiety, they do, they cause real physical changes. She says while different from an actual cardiac event, like a heart attack, stress and anxiety do affect the heart, especially in the long term. When someone is under stress, there's a lot of hormones that get released. The fight or flight hormones like adrenaline, we call it epinephrine, and that sends a direct signal to the heart heart to beat faster and beat stronger and it triggers a whole cascade of effects. In a real heart attack, what's happening is one of the blood vessels that feeds your heart, that supplies blood to your heart, is getting blocked up. It's part of the heart muscle is starting to die. But the tricky thing is your body might use the same symptoms, an ache in your arm, your neck, or even chest pain to show you there's a problem. It's not always clear cut. CDC data shows heart disease is the leading cause of death for Americans, killing about 700,000 people a year. In California, that number's about 66,500. In San Diego County, heart disease killed nearly 2,100 people in 2021, the county's second leading cause of death behind cancer. While some stress here and there likely won't cause a heart attack, long, unchecked periods of it aren't healthy either. We are not going to function well if we are not doing things like sleeping sufficiently, eating, hydrating, just taking care of ourselves by getting movement through the day. Mm -hmm. So those building blocks are so crucial. And from her point, Dr. Daniels agrees. It's way more than we understand. There's a huge link that we don't understand between the mental world and the physical world, including the heart. And one important note from Dr. Daniels, if you feel chest pain, shortness of breath, aches in your arms or upper body, go to the hospital. And if you feel like you need help to manage your stress or anxiety, you can find help. We've put a link to Rogers Behavioral Health's website on CBSA.com. Well, if you have traveled post pandemic, then you might have noticed a major cutback on housekeeping. The lack of cleaning is contributing to a growing bed bug problem. CBS 8's Rocio de la Fe describes what to look for the next time you travel. With travel on the rise, it's more important than ever to check for bed bugs. A thorough inspection might take you a few minutes, but it can save you a lot of time and pain down the road. Bed bug cases are on the rise across the country. That's according to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. We do see it in hotels a little bit more. We're getting more phone calls due to the pandemic. A lot of hotels were shut down and uh, they may not have kept up with the treatment like they should have. Tony uh, Boyle with Truly Nolan Pest and Termite Control says the insect can be hard to spot, so it's important to know where and what to look for. Check out the mattress itself. So I would take the linens and peel it back. Once all sheets are removed, look for blood stains or dark spots. Boyle suggests even looking underneath the mattress. If it's a, a large infestation, they'll be quite evident or noticeable. It's not just the bed itself. The insect is often found in chairs, couches, drawers, and even in the folds of curtains. And if not noticed right away, you can even take bed bugs home with you. They'll latch onto a shoelace, they'll latch onto any single part of clothing item or luggage that, that they can. Like many industries, hotels have struggled with staffing shortages since the pandemic, which forced many to cut back on daily housekeeping. The noticeable cleaning absence is partially to blame for the increase in infestations being reported across the country. 
front desk manager at the Urban Boutique Hotel in Little Italy, Vicente Franco says, although the San Diego Hotel is back to being fully staffed, the lack of cleaning can be a combination of staffing shortages and guest requests. You're going to have travelers, I guess, that come check in. They don't want service every day. Bedbugs can live up to a year and breed quickly, which makes them difficult to get rid of. They don't carry diseases, but they can leave itchy, uncomfortable, and often painful bites anywhere on your body. The bites can take a couple weeks to heal. Experts suggest inspecting your room before settling in and alerting the hotel staff immediately if you notice anything as soon as possible. Rocio de la Fe, CBS 8. Whew, good info. For more information about bed bugs and how to get rid of them, visit CBS8.com. Well, this week started with a loud boom and shake throughout San Diego. Now we might have an answer for you. We contacted Camp Pendleton about the issue and officials say that it can't exactly confirm, but they did say that there is live fire training going on. The routine training involved high explosive munitions that could be heard at any time throughout the day up to 50 miles away. A lot of you have been talking about it on social media. Nina says that she felt it in Ramona while Jack's Smith says that he thought it was his grandchildren and Matt says sitting on a concrete foundation and didn't even feel any movement yet the house shook and a loud bang from above. Camp Pendleton is running live trainings through March 5th. Well, a group of San Diego County cyclists has raised millions of dollars to fight multiple sclerosis. As we take you in the Zevely zone, Jeff is in San Marcos to meet some MS champions. There's an incredible man by the name of Howard Gray who lives in Kentucky, who inspired all of these passionate people to create Howard's Team. I want you all to know how honored I am to be here and a part of Howard's Team. I've had this disease almost 30 years. There you go. In 2008, the San Diego County cyclists started biking in honor of Howard Gray. The goal? Raise money to find a cure. Yes, we will, guaranteed. We will find a cure for MS. Tim Salmon has been battling multiple sclerosis for 20 years himself. When Tim could no longer surf because of the disease, he paddled one time from Catalina to mainland California, and now he rides. Our main goal is just Really to raise as much money as we can. Every October, Howard's team rides the bike MS Bay to Bay, and you're looking at the number one friends and family team in the nation who have together, I'm gonna do a drum roll, raised $2.8 million. Team captain Devin Callahan's daughter, Amelia. How old are you? 13. How much money did you raise? I raised $18,000. Is the youngest rider on the team. I have an aunt that has MS and she's in a wheelchair and she's like almost paralyzed. March is MS Awareness Month. Renata Sahajian is the MS Society chapter president. How does this money make a difference? Well, every dollar counts. We have amazing programs and services and research and we are so close to a cure. Let's go! These cyclists often start and end their rides at the Double Peak Brewing Company. Once you meet the MS champions, there is no doubt why you would cycle for multiple sclerosis. Lucinda and Frank Harton, the owners of Double Peak, created a beer to honor MS champions. Rob, Tim, they're all what we call champions, they're the team champions. Of the 65 cyclists on Howard's team, 12 for battling MS. All of these people are riding to help your cause. Yes. How's it feel? It feels awesome, actually. It, it, makes you not alone. When Rob Evans got the bad news 11 years ago, he says he made a choice. To give up or to fight. They all do. For Tim, Rob, Howard Gray, and every MS champion. Go Howard team on three. One, two, three. Go Howard team. In the Zevely zone. Jeff Sevel, CBS. If you'd like to learn more about Howard's team to either ride or make a donation, click on the help button on CBS8.com. Well, an Oceanside Air Force veteran spent his 90th birthday flying through the air at 130 miles per hour. Jeff now introduces us to the skydiving senior.
For this Zevely zone, we could focus on the Oceanside veteran who golfed in all 50 states, but we have another story to dive into. Still do it, I'm ready for it. On Mike Caliguri's 90th birthday, there was only one thing he wanted to do. I guess the adrenaline just uh, flows and you just do it. Mike served his country for 26 years. That's when I joined the Air Force 72 years ago. Danger must be Mike's middle name because for fun... The door opens <laughs> and it's freezing cold up there. The Vietnam veteran says jumping from 13,000 feet isn't just a family affair. My one daughter, two sons, four grandchildren. It's a family tradition. This time we had 11 immediate family members jumping. They all jumped out of the plane? 11 of us. Mike's wing woman is Jerry. He's a sweetheart, you really is. <laughs> she organized his special day. Jerry, did you jump? Are you crazy? <laughs> Would you do it? You know, that's the one thing my wife said, you're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping out of a plane. Mike never made that promise, and neither did his son, who also yeah, goes by so the name Mike. That's me jumping, and this is Mike down here. <laughs> <laughs> and the shoot is open, thank goodness. <laughs> Mike says his father jumps at the chance to do anything. If he had an opportunity to race Indy cars, he would do that. <laughs> Don't give him any ideas. <laughs> when you plummet out of the sky at 130 miles per hour, that's when you get the rush. For a few seconds, you feel and look like a man half your age. I lost my entire face. It was back here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people pay good money for that. <laughs> he then pulls the chute and soaks it all in. Then you look around and you see Oceanside Harbor and the beach and the ocean. What more could anyone ask for but a long, loving life filled with honor and the softest of landings? I guess I have this mindset that I got to use it or lose it. <laughs> In the Zevely Zone, <laughs> Jeff Zevely. You did it! Yeah. CBS 8. Oh, such good advice. And one of Mike's granddaughters was too young to skydive, so he plans to jump again at age 95 when she turns 18. Well, Plunge San Diego's new floating obstacle course is officially open to the public. The new course features a variety of challenging obstacles, inflatable tunnels, and hurdles for all ages. Plunge San Diego ran a naming contest for the obstacle course on social media. The winning name was White Wave. The plunge is located there inside of Fit Mission Beach at Belmont Park. Well, there is a male weedy sea dragon in La Jolla carrying about 70 eggs right now. Hearing that a male is carrying eggs may seem rare, but it is normal for the sea dragons. What's not normal is the successful transfer of eggs happening at an aquarium. So we sent our morning anchor, Netta Iranpour, to find out how it's even possible. That would okay. be the area where they would carry the eggs, is where it's bright yellow. If you look closely, you can see the babies and their eggs, their eyes, their tiny bodies. But what's not tiny is how these eggs look on the tail of this male. Yes, that's a male weedy sea dragon carrying quite the load. About 70 eggs, each one positioned in what looks like little cups that have formed on his spongy tail so he can carry the next generation. The first time we've had numerous eggs transferred from the female to the male. Let's take you back to how all of this um, excitement at Birch Aquarium began. Of the 16 weedy sea dragons in this exhibit, there was a female who took a liking to a certain male. They were swimming together side by side and they mirror each other and they swim around and they shimmy and then they move away and they come back again and do it again and they've been doing it, you know, like almost every day for a while until finally they decided this is the time and he's the right guy. That's when the female released her eggs and he accepted. He fertilized the eggs and took on the responsibility of carrying them all. She picked a really nice male who has nice big long tail 
and uh, and he did good. The transfer started in early January. Soon after, the Sea Dragon started hiding in the back of the exhibit. He also was listing every so often to one side, like he was feeling like it was a little bit extra weight and just kind of like not as active, just kind of hanging out there, swimming a little bit. Back Trust me, I know the feeling. <laughs> Sensing he wanted to be alone, Leslie Matsushiji and the team at Birch Aquarium carefully transferred him to a separate home. So the female sea dragon now has nothing to do with the process. It's okay that they're separate? Yes. Yeah, once the female releases her eggs and he takes the eggs, she's done. She doesn't have to do any other work. It's all up to the yeah, male now. Okay. <laughs> now, if you think the weedy sea dragons carrying eggs on their tail is fascinating, well, get this. For seahorses, it's the male seahorse that has a pouch. The female puts the eggs in the pouch, and the male is the one carrying during the entire time, which I can certainly have a lot of respect for. You can certainly call Leslie the expert of these types of fish. Seahorses and sea dragons are, in fact, fish. They have all the same body parts. They're just kind of oriented a little differently. Leslie's been at Birch for three decades. When they first opened, they only had one sea dragon in 1998. It wasn't until she went diving with the sea dragons when she learned how they truly live. Traveled to Australia and got to see them in their natural habitat and learned a lot. So she helped to create one of the largest sea dragon exhibits in the world that opened in 2019 here at nine feet deep and 18 feet wide. Like those two over there, they're definitely interested in each other. They have space to swim, eat, grow and court each other. They live in seagrass and kelp beds and as you can tell, camouflage really well. But the pregnant male is taking center stage, even while he's cared for behind the scenes. We want people to learn more about what the ocean holds and these have incredible animals. For Earth 8 at Birch Aquarium, I'm Netta Iranpour. It is incredible and stay tuned to CBS 8 and Birch Aquarium for the updates on how the male sea dragon is doing and when those eggs might hatch. We are in close contact with the sea dragon experts to be sure that we can let you know their status. Well, as always, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for staying informed and join me each week as I take you around San Diego. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Dave. Take good care.